So welcome all to this uh, webinar uh, organized by the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium. It's my great pleasure to um, um, introduce our uh, speaker here, uh, Nebojša Naki Cenovic, or as we all know the, him, Naki. Um, and um, this uh, webinar, as I said, is organized by the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium. So let me take a, a short uh, a minute to, to quickly introduce the uh, consortium. Um, oh yeah, here's the first slide. Um, so the mission of the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium is to uh, facilitate, foster support the development of integrated assessment models uh, and to also facilitate and coordinate the interaction between integrated assessment modeling teams around the world and to serve as a point of contact for the integrated assessment modeling community. Um, the IMC has, uh, is, is an international organization and has an international membership. So we have uh, um, around 70 members from uh, almost 30 countries from four continents. You can see them on the uh, upper right corner in, in blue. Um, and we have five scientific working groups where some important topics for integrated assessment modeling are covered. One on data protocols and management. So that's very important also to enhance um, data exchange, model comparison, transparency. One on model evaluation and diagnostics, also very relevant in the context of model comparison. The development of scenarios, which was the original founding um, um, yeah, um, inspiration, incentive, impetus for the IMC to develop uh, emission scenarios and integrated energy land scenarios. Now, um, the use of scenarios and the development of scenarios for climate-related financial analysis, it's a new scientific working group. And another new addition to our scientific working group is national scenarios, which shows that the community really has grown from a uh, focus on global mitigation pathways into also uh, a lot of work on national integrated assessment pathways. Now, let me try to move further. Yeah. So we uh, uh, have a number of awards. Um, um, the, and, and the biggest one of them is uh, the so-called Lifetime Achievement Award, which is going to distinguished uh, researchers that have devoted uh, uh, their, their lifelong work uh, to integrate an assessment modeling and have uh, a consistent lifelong contribution to progressing the community as well as the research of the community. So this aspect to also fostering and moving forward the community is really important uh, for us. So this, this uh, important award has now been um, awarded um, four times um, to, you can see the awardees at the bottom, um, starting with John Wind in 2018, who has been a great convener of integrated assessment modeling exercises uh, since a long time, to Bill Nordhaus, to Jay Edmonds, very uh, um, uh, renowned and, and impactful researchers for our community, to this uh, last year's awardee, uh, Naki, uh, who is uh, we are having the pleasure today to, um, to hear a presentation from him on uh, the last 15 years of integrated assessment, where he had a uh, a very strong um, impact on and, and shaped it uh, in, in a considerable way, but also, I guess, looking forward uh, to, to what would be the challenges of integrated assessment in the future. So a few words on, on Naki. He is uh, the former deputy director of, of uh, the deputy director general of IASA and uh, a professor of economics at Vienna University of Technology. Uh, he's one of the founding fathers of the message um, 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 uh, of the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium and one of the uh, key developers and has pioneered the development of the, of the message model. He has been an IPCC lead also CLA in many assessment reports and particularly he oversaw the production of the special report on emission scenarios in 2000. Um, so now, nowadays he is a member uh, of the group of seven chief scientific advisors to the European Commission, so continues to have an important uh, role and voice in, in uh, advising climate policy. Um, and with that, uh, before I hand over to Naki, looking forward to his uh, presentation, let me 
just uh, uh, put in a, um, uh, a pointer to our annual meeting, um, which will happen this year at uh, a College Park in Maryland, but there's also the possibility to, um, to participate online. Um, uh, and it will take from the 29th of November to the 1st of December. Registrations are still open. So thanks a lot again for joining and looking forward to your presentation, Naki. Over to you. Thank you very much, Elmar. Uh, it, it's also for the kind introduction. And uh, I would also like to th thank the consortium for the opportunity to give this presentation today. Just for your orientation, I plan to speak for about 40 minutes and hope that we will have enough time for the discussion. So to illustrate my arguments, uh, I would like to share the screen. I hope you can see it all, but I will also turn my camera off so that the advancement is quicker of the, of the slides. So here we are. Uh, so my title is, as Elmar mentioned, is I would like to have a person to basically give you a personal view of the history of the of how the consortium was built over the last five, 15 years. And then in the second part, say a few things about uh, the challenges ahead that maybe integrated assessment modeling community can take on. Uh, so let me start with uh, with the same slide if I can advance it. There we go, with the, with the same slide that uh, Elmar has actually shown um, of, of the, it's a great privilege to be among the three other recipients of the award. I mean, as Elmar said, John is the pillar of the whole assessment with the organization of the Energy Modeling Forum. In many ways, it preceded the organization of the consortium about Bill Nordhaus. I don't have to say much. Uh, I had the great pleasure of working with him in the 70s at IASA when he was thinking about building the DICE model. Um, clearly one of the pioneers of integrated assessment. And Jay, let me just say that many of you might not know that, but Jay is the only colleague I know uh, who has been involved in the development of all of the IPCC scenarios from the beginning. And I will say a few words about that. So let me just say it's a great privilege to receive this award. And uh, certainly the other three colleagues deserved it more than I. So I would like to start with this picture. I hope you can see it now. You might think that this is just another meeting, but for me, it's not another, just another scientific meeting. This all happened in 2006 in Aspen, just before the snow mass meetings that John and colleagues were always organizing. And at this meeting, uh, and uh, there is a report in WCRP about this meeting, if you're interested. But the reason for why this is important, at least in my view, at this meeting, the notion of the SSPs and RCPs has been designed for the first time. Because by that time, by 2006, ESRE scenarios were roughly about the 10 years old in the terms from the point of view when they were first uh, developed. And so as scenarios have a limited shelf life, the idea was to respond to the new challenges. So for me, this is the beginning and I will spend uh, some time trying to uh, explain what happened thereafter. Uh, and um, I would say that immediately the next year after two, uh, 2006, this consortium was organized by, and that's also on the website of the of the consortium, uh, by YASA, EMF, and this is where John's role is so important, and the NIS in Japan. And below in the three columns that don't belong to the organizations, but in the three columns, you see the colleagues who have been, uh, so to say, the founding group for the consortium. And very soon thereafter, then IPCC also promoted and supported very much the work of the consortium. So this is really the beginning. Let me now go to the more substantive part and then I will return to the consortium. I think today in particular during the COP27 now in Egypt, uh, I, think, I think most of our, us are acutely aware of the huge challenges ahead. We have wars around the world, also in Europe, pandemic is not over. And then I would say the biggest challenge is that the climate change still 
looms great, as well as the injustice, inequality in the world, and ever increasing on pressure on the other Earth systems, not, ju not, not just the climate system. And so I think this is a unique opportunity of the consortium on the, uh, and integrated modeling community to contribute in trying to resolve these uh, challenges and that I will try to address in the second part of my presentation. So where did it all start for me? And as I said, this is a personal perspective. It all really started with me when I worked at the Nuclear Research Center in Karlsruhe in 1972, exactly 50 years ago, when the book, uh, The Limits to Growth was published by Dana and Dennis Meadows and their colleagues. And for me, that was a kind of a path changing publication. And below you see one of the um, key figures from the report, and I put the green line at the today's time. And you can see that, of course, in detail, they didn't get the picture right. But in principle, as a, you know, from the meta level, indeed they do. We have problems with resources, population will be peaking pretty soon, um, emissions hopefully we'll be peaking at that time, the greenhouse gases were not in the picture. But the point is it provided a, a dynamic view of the global development. And this is what really appealed to me. And this is uh, I was a huge motivation. And that's why I started working on that instead of continuing to work on the nuclear safeguards and the optimization of the nuclear fuel cycle, I shifted toward modeling. And let me just say that uh, then I had the great pleasure of working with them as well at YASA, because YASA had a global modeling uh, uh, activity together with Jay Forrester, uh, uh, Pestel and Mesarovic and, and the Bariloche model and so on. And then I, then I in, in her email before going to YASA in 1987 for a visit said, and I've highlighted that she said, I love going there because it is a place to work with my friends from Hungary, Poland, Russia, and other East Bloc countries. So remember, this was during the Cold War. And I hope that in these difficult times today, science will also continue in being universal and international. And the consortium contributes to that in a very important way. So what did I start working with? Uh, I um, met Cesare Marchetti very soon when I was at IASA. Uh, and we started working on um, what, what we call the logistic substitution model, trying to understand the dynamics of energy and other systems. And this is a picture, maybe some of you are familiar. On the left is, the, is one of the, our reports, and on the right is the publication Energy in a Finite World. Uh, for those of you who have not seen that report, uh, the book, it's from 1981, and it is definitely the first truly global energy study with scenarios going all the way to 2030, as you can see here as well in this picture. Now, if you look at the picture, whether it's correct or wrong is not an issue. The issue is, in my view, that the picture outlines a possible, uh, a possible future dynamics and that one can add new scenarios. And if I was doing this today, I certainly would have not been so optimistic about the nuclear. I would have had a a penetration rate similar to natural gas and oil, and then we would be roughly correct where the nuclear is today, and I would have advanced solar a little bit earlier. Uh, so in any case, but the point is that I think that looking into the future provides preparedness, how to deal with the crisis and how to deal with the challenges ahead of us and the climate, I think, is at the center of those. So let me show you then the, the scenarios from this book, Energy in a Finite World, from that work is then essentially 50 years old. The book was published in 81, after almost a decade of work. Um, this is the high scenario in the book going all the way to 2050, so 70 years into the future, very similar to what we are doing now in the consortium, going toward the end of the century and beyond. This is the high scenario. So how does it look like? Well, emissions, twice as much as we have today, 88 gigatons instead of about 40. Concentrations, about 500 ppm, slightly higher than we have today. And the energy, about 1,000 exajoules, about 30 or 20, 30% more than we have in the world. And that's where the red line is. And uh, this might not be a surprise because this was a very high fossil fuel energy scenario going into the future. As you can see, also the temperature change there for today would be about two and a half degrees, and we are actually at about 1.3, let us say. And so this is 
definitely well above what the history had, uh, how the history evolved. But here is the, the low scenario. And that low scenario is below the history, as you can see today, 11 gigatons of carbon, 400 ppm, that's quite accurate, 760 exajoules, also quite close to what is happening. But please note, if you see in the middle, in this scenario, the emissions have already peaked in, in about year 2000, 20 years ago. So this scenario is, has quite lots of renewables and has lots of nuclear energy and much, much uh, less fossils. In, um, uh, certainly, much, uh, it, it, it's, it's a scenario where the, uh, the, the, where the world leaves coal behind. So the point is that this was well below what actually happened. So these two scenarios, and there were only two, have actually bracketed what happened. And from that point of view, they're useful, even if though in the detail, the analysis, of course, couldn't predict what was, what was going to happen. Future is unpredictable. But it is important that it looked at the alternatives in order to generate preparedness and the discussion about the future development. Unfortunately, mitigation didn't occur at the rate that would have been desired from that perspective. And so that's the point that I would like to make. I think this is a really important, um, uh, really important part of this uh, discussion. I just got the note that participants didn't see the slides before. Can somebody confirm that you actually I have now just advanced the slide? I hope that that works for everybody. I'm so, seeing the slides and it's advancing. So okay. It okay. Thank you, Elmar. It's just good to know for the control. Okay. So here is a here is the the slide actually also from 2000 and, and I think beginning of 2007, an IPCC slide that shows you the history of the scenarios where uh, well actually the history and the future of scenarios where IMC. Um, the consortium played a very, very important role. So the first scenarios were in 1990. Uh, I will show them to you. Uh, SA-90 scenarios, and then that was follow up with the six IS-92 scenarios, both in the first assessment report. And as I said, Jay was an author and, of all of those scenarios. Then there was an evaluation of scenarios in 95, very important. And then the panel made a decision, as you can see in 96, to develop new scenarios that led then to the development of the SRES. And now in uh, then in TAR, SRES, by the way, was only about baseline scenarios, alternative baseline scenarios and alternative driving forces. A big shortcoming was that the terms of reference didn't allow mitigation or stabilization scenarios. And that was done in TAR, uh, mitigation scenarios. So some people call them post-stress. And then in 2007, that was already after this slide was presented by APCC, stabilization scenarios were developed, and then the work started on the uh, scenarios for the AR5. Uh, so this was then definitely the future. So let me then just um, show you the first set of scenarios, the SA90, uh, Dennis Tierpark and Pierre Velinga were the lead authors among many other colleagues, including Jay, as I mentioned. It included four scenarios. So our IASA energy in a finite world had two. Here there were four even number. And I have to submit to you that I'm a fan of even numbers because there is no middle scenario that people would anchor themselves to. In this case, two of them were emission scenarios, clearly a high one, red, green, a low emission scenarios, and two mitigation scenarios. Uh, the bottom one with accelerated policies, had we followed that scenario back from the time when they were developed in 1990, had we followed that scenario, we would have stabilized at two degrees or less. Um, and this is why we need to peak today is because we missed, missed that, that crossroads, that juncture, uh, uh, juncture in the fu future of humanity. And as you can see, the historical data go along the top scenario uh, and um, so we were pretty much in the upper range, but the IPCC first set of scenarios did bracket the range. And then the second produced very shortly afterwards actually included six scenarios, uh, a little bit more complicated. So you might ask why did IPCC decide to do scenarios just two years later? Well, the idea was to look at the wider range of the driving forces of future emissions. And this is illustrated here. Somehow the central case 
uh, could be argued was a scenario A, the red one, with high energy and high population. Then B was a derivative, the same except mitigation in the OECD countries in the global north. And you can see here, at least from that perspective, it may, had little impact on the emissions. And then, um, then the next one was, was D with more solar and biofuels. So clearly that made a, a bigger, bigger impact. Uh, and then we have the scenario E that brackets the, uh, the range on the top, uh, which is very high oil and gas and high population together with the nuclear moratorium. And this is why the emissions are so high. And then in the F, the F has in contrast the highest population, but not the highest emissions because it has high renewables and high nuclear. So it's a structural change in the energy supply. And you can see that the lower case is actually you know, also in the region of the current stabilization low scenarios. And the higher uh, case, the highest case is well over 100 gigatons. So uh, up to 120, 30 gigatons. So many times more that we, what we have today, and hopefully we will not be on the development path. But that basically illustrates to you how this first set of scenarios evolved. And then after the review came the idea to develop a new set in the SRS report. So let me just tell you from my personal perspective, what were the big innovations in SRS scenarios? Um, it was based on extensive literature review and the narrative storylines. It was based on stories about the future. And my take is that it took us more than half of the time of, the, uh, uh, of producing the special report on agreeing on the storylines. That, that was somehow most important. Uh, alternative storylines of the future that account for different driving forces and different emissions outcomes. Another innovation was not one modeling tool, but six alternative modeling tools to see what the range is between the quantification of narratives across the model. So I think that was a completely new perspective based also, I think, of some of the work in EMF. And I would say that's also the founding, the founding stone of the consortium as well to have different modeling approaches. But as you might imagine, that resulted in too many scenarios and 40 emission scenarios. Uh, that's way too many for anybody to digest or definitely not too many for the climate uh, earth system models to run. And so we agreed on six illustrative scenarios, again, an even number just for your orientation. But the big shortcoming of this work was in my view, well, there were many shortcomings, but the biggest shortcoming was indeed no mitigation policies were included. And so this is how one can see what was done. Basically the scenarios are a result of the four narratives of the four consistent stories and, and agreed stories about alternative future developments that were then quantified by six different models. So that's how the work was conducted and here you can see the scenarios so it might not be a surprise to say the scenarios covered the range of the literature that was also covered by IIS 92 again the top somewhere well over 100 gigatons the bottom down to about 10 gigatons or so still positive because there is no mitigation scenario so some of you might ask well then how come you have the low scenarios well, the low scenarios like the green one um, is there because of the combination of the driving forces. This is a sustainable storyline that, for example, elim eliminates uh, air pollution. And by eliminating air pollution, it also reduces the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, by having more equity in the world, reduces also the greenhouse gas emissions. So there were a number of factors. I will not go into the detail why there is also a lower bound of the scenarios even though there were not mitigation cases. So 40 scenarios altogether and six uh, uh, markers. <clears throat> and then in the post stress in TAR, uh, mitigation scenarios were added. So this is the full range of stress going very high up. And then in the green, you can see the mitigation cases that go down essentially to zero. Uh, again, um, not a strong peak in the lo lowest mitigation cases because the mitigation would have started relatively early. Now, 
in 19, in 2007, some of you might re recall that IPCC got a Nobel Prize for peace, and I think that enhanced the visibility of IPCC. It, in many ways, I think it enhanced policy relevance of IPCC, so it was not just a scientific effort. It was an effort directed at uh, providing uh, evidence-based information to the policymakers and the decision makers in private and public sector. So I think this was a kind of a path breaking um, uh, uh, development in the work of I IPCC. And luckily, also the time when the consortium was de developed in order to provide the integrated scenarios that would be needed for the future, much more relevant work of IPCC as we see now. So this is a title page of the presentation I gave in 2006 at the IPCC lead authors meeting in New Zealand. Uh, um, that was based on the very, very long and, and uh, interesting and creative discussion among mo most of the modeling groups of how we might tackle the scenarios. So um, these were, I will just present two recommendations for the new scenarios that now already exist. These are the SSPs and RCPs. Uh, that the details need to be worked out with the climate modeling community. This is almost self-evident, but what was really challenging is that the scenarios need to be developed very quickly and um, that, uh, that the modeling teams would provide benchmark scenarios uh, that would be then used for the Earth system mod uh, modeling community um, and that each modeling team that is willing to contribute to this important effort uh, needed to make a commitment to provide resources to complete the task, not just to start the work. Uh, that all worked out very well, and that also they have to provide demonstration. They can pro uh, they, they they can develop scenarios, provide the scenarios that meet all in capital letters criteria outlined in the previous slide. Um, and so this is the path breaking moment in some ways. If you look at the at the top graphs, you can see how the scenarios were developed before. And that, that's true for TAR scenarios, it's true for post-stress, for TAR scenarios, for the IS and, and the other, other sets. Basically, there would be a range of socioeconomic variables from that with the integrated energy, land use and other models, one would derive the emissions. From emissions, one would go to concentrations of all of the relevant greenhouse gases and also aerosols and other radiatively active substances. And then the earth system models will figure out the climate outcomes. Well, at that meeting in 2006 in, in Aspen, uh, Colorado, that I mentioned at the beginning, a new way was proposed of doing scenarios in order to be on a faster timeline, even though many groups are involved in the production. So the idea was, to agree on the concentrations of forcing. And then the integrated models would then uh, look at the socioeconomic variables and emission outcomes that would lead to that forcing. And in parallel, that's why it was called parallel process, in parallel, the uh, earth systems groups would look at the climate outcomes and that way it would be possible to close the loop, let me call it that way, from driving forces all the way to climate impacts uh, and the vulnerabilities and mitigation in a parallel process to quicken the time of the development of the scenarios. At the beginning, the idea was to have um, three long-term stabilization scenarios, three watts per square meter, four and a half, six, and 8.4 would have been the baseline. That was the original idea. And um, the reason why the separation is about two watts per square meter is that at that time, the Earth Systems modeling community said that their models cannot really resolve uh, less than two watts per square meter, and that, 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 that interpolation should be used and scaling uh, to look at a, you know, more detailed, uh, at a more detailed resolution. So these were basically the four pathways that were agreed upon. Uh, at the end of the day, the three became 2.6 that you can see in this graph, 2.6 and 8.4 became 8.5 as the highest case. So there were four, four concentration pathways, and these are the corresponding emissions that were then developed by the integrated assessment community together with the handshake of the earth system models, impacts community, and so on. And I would argue that for the first time, 
different modeling communities were talking to each other um, in a really interactive and important way on developing new scenarios and the consortium played absolutely in my view the key role and these are the outcomes that you're all familiar with and even 2.6 now already has net negative emissions that is quite significant in my view uh, after a peak um, shortly behind behind us, which actually didn't occur except the lower emission uh, emissions during the COVID pandemic. So these were the new scenarios um, I'm adding here, just that you can see that sprouted quite a lot of literature um, and, and research on the scenarios. This is some of the work that I have been involved in in the global energy assessment with many colleagues who are now in the consortium to develop a set of low emission scenarios that you can see in the lower bracket to understand a little bit better what net negative would mean and how the peaking and so on, how the dynamics would look like. So that was basically uh, uh, the RCPs and then the parallel process started that led to the SSPs. That's at least my interpretation. And you, as, as you know, there are five SSPs. So you're all familiar with that. So I will not, I will not comment on that much more. But this, as you can see, that actual best plan from 2006, 2007 has been actually implemented with RCPs and then an update of RCPs with the SSPs that would match um, that, that would match the concentrations with one big exception. It was decided to go for one and a half degree stabilization rather than two degrees at 60% likelihood. So that was the bracketing the lower case, uh, the lower emission uh, uh, profiles was then one and a half degree stabilization. And this is how, at least I, when I looked how the uh, um, SSPs look like, there is a range because of a different models and the emissions do bracket the upper upper range that we have uh, in the literature. And so very similar to the beginning of the scenarios, but the lower cases are deeply negative. And then in this, to round up this very brief historical account, uh, I just want to say a few words about the special report on one and a half to which many of you have contributed. I was no longer involved in that work myself. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, you can see that the focus on lots of negative emissions, the S5 has exceedingly high negative emissions. I think it's very, very difficult to understand how that might actually occur to have almost half of the current emissions or even more in terms of negative emissions. But what I wanted to highlight is on the other side, the lead scenario, the low energy demand scenario, that, that one has very few uh, negative emissions and quite a lot of change in the energy end use in particular. And I think one has to think of similar equivalent changes in, in food and other sectors. But the point is that this huge changes in the energy end use also reduce the need for negative emissions and hopefully also improve the lifestyle and the quality of life of the people in such a future world, but it would require serious lifestyle changes and I think also changes of habits and so on. So it's not an easy scenario, but I think it's a path making scenario. And in my comments, I would like to also to address conclude in second part, I would like to address some of those questions. So what could that be? Now, well, let me start with what I think is that, uh, and many of you are working already on that, but I just wanted to highlight it. It is important in my view to develop holistic sustainable development pathways, not just mitigation pathways. I know that right now much of the sustainability work is derived from the climate mitigation scenarios, but I think this needs to be done much more explicitly, accounting for the interleakages among many sectors, and in particular with the emphasis on human development uh, and, and human lifestyle changes in the perhaps in the you know, in the norms, in the in the value systems. So I think these are the type of things that we cannot model right now, but I think they're an important challenge for the modeling community. In the activity called the world in 2050, and some of you might be familiar with it, we try to reduce the complexity of um, 
of the Sustainable Development Goals and their 169 targets down to about six transformations. And I think it would be important whether it's now six or fewer or more, that's a different issue. But I think it would be important to develop integrated models that can holistically fully account for the transformations needed to achieve this kind of led futures, if I may put it that way, in, in all of the sectors and the full society. Full society. As, a, as bracketing the future possibilities on the low side, because we have lots of high, high, high scenarios. Now, so I would say there would, would, would be three things that need to be done. Uh, full range of alternative pathways, also in this lower bracketed uh, uh, space, and to continue the tradition of the consortium with different methodologies, or perhaps involving uh, new modeling approaches such as agent-based and so on. And um, to really understand how this transformation uh, toward achieving sustainable goals to achieve the safe and resilient future could work out. And um, in that sense, what I'm trying to say is that I think we need genuine stabilization or genuine stabilization or, or genuine sustainable development pathways, not merely ones that are derived from the baselines, but the ones that are constructed in the first place uh, to bring this kind, of, this kind of change. And I would be interested to see how such outcomes might differ from the mitigation cases. So what I'm proposing based on this old, uh, and I know that many of you are thinking about that, I'm not the only one, but um, based on this uh, graphic from Paul Ruskin that's 20 years old now, um, I would argue that what uh, the integrated models do really well is these proximate drivers, population, economy, technology, and to some extent also governance, perhaps exogenously. But I think what is very difficult right now is to model values and needs, knowledge, understanding, power structures, culture, but that this is undoubtedly really important to understand what future alternatives lie ahead of us. And this is why I would like to amplify scenario narratives, because I think we can do that in the narratives. There are, there are theories of governance, for example, and then make sure that the model uh, quantifications actually ref reflect those narratives, but one day I hope that part of that could be also endogenous. And so, for example, how to model such big revolutions like the Industrial Revolution that in, on my clock started two centuries ago in 1826 with the Stockton Darlington Steam Railway, and I think nobody could have anticipated how explosive the development would have been of the Industrial Revolution that also led to the benefit of many, but also the problems that we have now. But I think this is what we need to also be able to capture in terms of alternative developments when we project the future. And um, I think a good example is the paper that is now four years old, that actually, in my view, is a kind of an origin of some of the logic behind the lead scenario that illustrates how big the potential is of some of the new um, um, technological, but also institutional and um, organizational, uh, organizational innovation. So, What's illustrated here is uh, in the middle, some digital and analog devices that are replaced uh, by a mobile phone. Um, those devices require about 150 watts of energy, but the modern smartphone requires 100 times less energy. Uh, so if even if everything else is kept constant, this is 100 times less emissions, and it provides more services than the devices it replaces, and about 25 times less what you might call gray energy, embodied energy and embodied emissions. So it's a kind of a win-win technology. And I think what is also important to highlight is that it occurred in 30 years. Uh, and it's very democratic in the sense, if I may use that word, in the sense that everybody in the world has a mobile phone, even the, let's say, about a billion people who do not have access or cannot afford access to electricity, they also have a mobile phone. And so it shows that in 30 years, new forms of human communication, new technologies, new infrastructures can diffuse. And we have about just le less than 30 years to 2050 when we are supposed to be uh, zero emissions or one and a half or two degrees stabilization. So there, historical examples that show that it can be done, but of course it wouldn't be easy. 
And um, technologies that share that, that I think many of you are trying to model. I've been involved in many attempts to endogenize technological uncertainty and learning in our models. And here is an example that I think comes from Arnold from about um, almost uh, 15 years ago that shows the improvement or the learning of the photovoltaic cells in, in pink, pink reddish color with the doubling of the markets, about 20% decreasing costs per doubling, and that continued to this day. Today, we are well below $1 per watt. But there are some other technologies that have negative learning because they're lumpy. It takes a long time to design them. Just the overnight costs for nuclear reactors that take basically 10 years to build are so huge that the costs are escalating. But the uncertainty is very large, as you can see with the dashed lines. And this is something that not only needs to be endogenized, which is not easy. Uh, by the way, Bill Nordhaus worked on that already uh, some 40 years ago when he was at IASA. Uh, and um, they need to be endogenized. But in any case, even if it's exogenous, we have to cover this uncertainty also for the future technologies, in my view. And there are many other options. So let me just give you a few examples. Uh, I'm very much a fan of this technology. It's a Z uh, ZEP or zero emissions power plant that actually has been built in Texas. Uh, and what's unique about that, it has a CO2 turbine in the middle. Uh, and it burns methane uh, with, uh, with oxygen, and then uh, pure CO2 is produced plus water vapor, and the CO2 can be then bled and, and uh, stored underground. So it's a technology that could reduce the emissions also of some of the fossil energy sources down to zero, but in, in conjunction, uh, con uh, conjunction with uh, green methane, it would be actually net negative emission technology. Another one that we will need very badly, in addition to batteries and other storage technologies, are the innovative storage uh, systems. I am a fan of this one as well. It's a hydro storage, but not on the top of the mountain, but at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, that could combine with the offshore wind and offshore renewables in general. Um, but it could be also on land under uh, designed as well under heavy weights. Uh, the point is that there are new technologies that might become come to bear over this time horizon of 30 years. Clearly, this one would come into later, uh, but the ZEP power plants could be built relatively soon. And then perhaps the biggest challenge is the infrastructure. And uh, again, this is perhaps a little bit provocative. Um, uh, it's an idea of having magnetic levitation and energy supergrid for Asia. Um, you can see that in an insert, the idea of the supergrid would be cryogenic hydrogen, um, hopefully zero emissions hydrogen, green hydrogen, together with, um, with the superconducting electricity, together in one, uh, one system to bring remote uh, remote energy to the urban areas, and then the magnetic levitation train in an evacuated cube. And you might think this is all science fiction over the time frame that we are talking about, but it isn't. Uh, China is planning to build such a maglev. They will start construction soon on a test, uh, test stretch. And you know, I believe China can do it. They have 40,000 kilometers of fast rail. That is already a huge step in the right direction. And here is an image of the prototype cabin and the prototype train is also being built. So it is in the books and it is conceivable that this might happen. And then perhaps most extreme, if we cannot replace aircraft with, uh, uh, with magnetic levitation, zero emission, then there are also possible designs of aircraft that could be built over the end of this 30 year period. Um, that would be zero emissions. This one I think is very attractive because if you, if you look at the big turbofan at the end, it recuperates energy on landing. It would have fuel cells with hydrogen for takeoff and would produce some of its own solar energy while uh, uh, flying above the clouds. So there are these innovation technologies. We need innovative systems to go along and we need the new behaviors, new norms, if you are going to follow that low pathway and avoid huge net negative emissions. And I think digitalization is the way forward. Um, it's a technology that has many dangers, but also huge opportunities like artificial intelligence, deep learning, and so on. 
And I would like to, toward the conclusion of my talk, borrow this slide from Charlie Wilson, whom I think many of you know. I think he has rightly put here a couple of examples of how the digitalization and the new system, together with the new behaviors, uh, could bring such a world around. So one on top, you have examples, posit positive examples of going from the ownership to usership. Uh, shared economy would be very important. Uh, then, uh, most importantly, from my point of view, is connecting the disconnected systems in the in the future. So that would be, I think, a portfolio here of possibilities, changing consumer preferences, such as new diets, uh, service rather than ownership, shared circular economy, new communications towards society 5.0, and peer-to-peer -peer systems, in particular the modular and granular technologies. So I uh, I have only three more slides, Elmar. Just that you know, I'll finish on time. Uh, I just wanted to finish one of, one of the ideas I think that goes in the direction what I was just saying, and I think of what some of the modeling teams are thinking about is so-called Bauhaus world. The idea is here. Um, to generate um, tangible and positive experience for people in su with such future systems. So not just sustainability and inclusion, but the third bullet there with an arrow, also beauty, that the built environment is not just re re reusable and sustainable and inclusive, but it's also beautiful, that aesthetics play a very important role. And I think this is also something that ideally we can uh, integrate in our future pathways work. And this is... Uh, definitely the last one I wanted to, well, actually penultimate one. I borrowed this one from Granger Morgan. I believe he presented that in 2013 at one of the Snowmass meetings. And what you can see here, it tells, tells thousand words. On the vertical, on the horizontal, you have railways and flying machines and inter uh, communication systems, individual mobility and industrial processes that in periods of about 50, 50 years fundamentally changed and provided new systems. So it's conceivable that we will have something like that by the mid-century. Nobody knows how the system would look like, but I've put in few examples that would be zero emission. So I think this is what we need to work on, is to understand a little bit better how some of those things might occur, not just what needs to be done, but also how that could be done. And this is the final one, Elmar, with uh, perhaps most provocative, but I still want to finish with that one. Uh, you see here on top gra uh, graph, and one can make other examples, that when old systems like canals saturate in the history, new systems were introduced. So when railways saturated, then we had roads, or I don't know what the next would be. Maybe we think about Internet Plus when the current one saturates. Uh, but below, I think, and that is what is interesting, in those periods, we have the strong flare of prices, inflation, and a very high rate of technological change of the new technologies. And now the 50 years are up in, in 2020, 2025. So let I, I at least personally hope that um, we will see a new spurt of innovation leading us in some of those attractive futures and that the current price hike will end once those technologies take over. Uh, so now I definitely stop and this slide is a picture that Jay sent me. Uh, stop Naki, and I think it's time to stop. So thank you very much. Over to you, Elmar. Yeah, thank you so much, Naki, for this uh, exciting presentation, so comprehensive, giving us the history of scenario building and the close connection to integrated assessment modeling to the challenges of the day and, and some of the, the visions you presented. And um, now it's time for questions uh, and discussion. So I invite you, the, the audience, to uh, um, um, yeah, raise your questions and um, your discussion points. Um, we, you have two ways to, uh, to do this. One is you can use the Q&A function and just put a question in there and we can then relay it to, to Naki. And the second one is actually uh, you raise your hand uh, like we uh, uh, I used to do this in, um, in Zoom. And then we can give you um, uh, speaking. Right, as, as far as I understand. So please um, start thinking of your questions. And while I'm trying to monitor this here, maybe Naki, I start off um, uh, with a question. Um, you've pointed out to this, I actually, I have two questions. So one is, 
Um, we are now living in a time of uh, um, shocks. So you mentioned the COVID shock, you mentioned uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, and um, so the question is how do we reflect it in our modeling, in our scenarios? Uh, and uh, I would be interested to hear uh, your thoughts about this. Yeah, that, that, I think, Elmar, uh, expectedly, this is a very pertinent question that you're posing. Yeah. Because I, I think the integrated models and I think the way we have evolved, I think our argument has always been, these are the long-term pathways, what happens in the long-term. And one cannot match all of the, let's say, fluctuations, uh, all of the disturbances that happen in the short term. But as you also correctly mentioned, there are many, many more now national uh, assessments. And I think that poses that question as well that you're posing. First of all, the more we zoom in the detail, the more, let's say, detail needs to be in there, in my view. That's my number one stylized fact. So that's a challenge. The second challenge is, since we are so late with go going toward net zero, the next 10 years will be crucial. And so I think the short term becomes much more pertinent. So I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking now aloud on top of my head, but I, I wonder whether we need to complement our long-term scenarios with some shorter term approaches that might be able to better reflect the volatility and short-term crisis that occur and possible recovery, how to get back on the track, let's put it that way. Because we have seen that I think that the COVID pandemic has indeed reduced the emissions, but only temporarily. Uh, I think in Europe, it's now minus 4% compared to 1990, but in most around the world, it's actually above 90, uh, 1990 emissions. So how to model that, I think would be very important to add and it might be a complementary approach. So I don't have an answer to you, but I think this is something that is really important for us as a community to worry about how we can do that. And as you know, uh, you know, in other modeling communities like climate, they try to reproduce the past. I know that that's with us, our models next to impossible because of so many different driving forces. But I think you put your finger on a soft spot, let me put it that way. I think it is something that we really need to worry about on the way forward. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Um, I see one question coming in from, from, uh, from uh, yeah, now the questions are coming, that's, that's great. Uh, so I have Dale on the list. Um, could we give Dale speaking right, please? Uh, yeah. Back. Okay. Um, all right. I don't know if I can turn my camera on, but you do see a picture of me. Um, very much enjoyed the talk, uh, Naki, and good to see you. Um, I picked up on a couple of things that you also mentioned in terms of the value of the narratives going back to the SRES and needing to put more effort in that. And you also briefly mentioned moving into complementary tools such as agent-based modeling. So uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on challenges for the community, the IMC, which tends to be heavily um, model-based and particularly the IAMs, which don't have the level of detail or level of individual detail. And I recognize there are some serious challenges of combining those. So I'd just like to get your thoughts on on how the consortium um, can work toward improving those aspects or adding in those aspects. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dale. Great to see you too, even though it's a still picture, <laughs> but hopefully we'll be able to catch up soon. Any case, I, I, I think this is uh, related also to Elmar's question, in, Elmar's question many times. So first of all, I think we have to continue working on the narratives. I think narratives are really important for uh, getting the quantifications in the right direction. Let me put it that way. I know it's more work and it's more difficult because it's somehow uh, inverse engineering of the model, but I still think that narratives are the key. I think we have to work more on the narratives. Maybe they can incorporate as the first step some of the things we have been discussing uh, that might even lead to the new you know, new wave of scenarios. They don't have to be quite in, in, you know, in quotes, official scenarios for the IPCC. They can be experimental scenarios within our community. I think we have to formulate these research questions to look like, uh, to, to look what it, it means. And I, I see personally also a second tier involving other other tools they don't you know they don't need to be full-fledged models in the in the climate community people talk about the you know uh 
you know, limited, uh, you know, isolated stand-up models that can only capture part of the problem. Why can we not do that? I mean, we can have, you know, let's say a simple model in quotes on induced technology. We can have a simple model about some of the changes in the dietary or energy values or practices. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking. You know, we not all models need to be integrated, uh, but they can inform the integrated models. And then if there is something good that comes out, then what can introduce the module? At the end of the day, that's how, in my view, the integrated models emerge as well. They were originally agriculture and energy models and the climate module was added and this module was added and emissions and so on. Uh, so that, that's what I would say, experimental mode. We still continue emphasis on the integrated models because they are reproducible. They can provide the type of things that the climate and other communities might need, but experiment around it and have a two-tiered approach. So, you know, maybe at the meeting, uh, the next meeting, one can have a small informal session on how that might, might happen. Thanks. We have a question by Volker now on, on, on the Q&A. Um, and um, so Volker asked, should the community do more backward looking research, revisiting scenarios developed over the past decades to systematically derive insights for future analysis? Over to you, Naki. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I, I, I think this is a good proposal. Uh, you, you know, in some ways, uh, this could be kind of reverse analysis because we know what the past was. And then we look into the, you know, in the models with the driving forces that might emulate the past with the knowledge from the past. So it's not exactly, you know, doing initial conditions at, let's say, at 1850 and seeing what happens, but it might be kind of reverse engineering. We know the outcomes and we know roughly what the driving forces were. And then we, we select the pathways that I think best emulate what has actually happened. And that might be some le uh, lecture for the future. In particular, concerning what we just talked before, Elmar uh, and Dale, about the discontinuities, how to do those. So, I, I, you know, I, I think uh, this is a good proposal from Falker as well, maybe to be taken up at one of the informal meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we are generating new proposals here. That shows that this is a really innovative um, uh, discussion. Um, and then I have, uh, yeah. oh, there's another. So this will be the last question then. Um, okay. By Rachid Mabe. Uh, so uh, how applicable is your new scenario vision to, to um, the global south? Um, this part of the world is more impacted, but still not really in the future scenario. Uh, um, mode and and more impacted in the short term. I think that's a great question also to end this. Yeah, uh, absolutely great question. And I, I think that the key question that has been, I think, also at least troubling me for a long time. And this is why I like that example of the of the mobile phone I presented, because that shows an example where the global south actually did not lag be, behind the no global north. And so I think we need to think about the leapfrogging, how in the in the future storylines and the integrated assessment pathways, we can factor in uh, the leapfrogging of the of the global south. I think if we are talking about the positive narratives and positive tipping in the future, in my view, that's the key. Um, but it also means that we have to strengthen the participation of the groups from the global south. And maybe that thing that we discussed a few minutes before, you know, the participation may not need to be in terms of the full integrated model, even at the national scale. It could be a standalone model of one part of the problem. Uh, and so I, I think in some ways one could have a very similar approach to have a much greater importance to, for the pathways from the global south. And by the way, maybe the last comment, since we are running out of time, uh, is that in SRES, that was for me the richest experience was actually uh, to have authors uh, from the global south. I mean, it was a very balanced writing team, excellent writing team, where many, many things occurred. Let me just give you one example that you understand that perspectives are important in pathways. We were troubled how to call the scenarios. And as you know, they have completely unimaginative names. But one of the idea was to give them 
you know, color names, like the low one would have been green, another one silver. And a colleague then from Africa said, no, for God's sake, that's the last thing we want to do. Because in some of the cultures, colors have a meaning. And then all of a sudden, you're superimposing meaning on the scenario that was not intended. So I think this is why it's so important to have that, you know, input from multiple perspectives on the pathways. And I hope that many of them would include leapfrogging for the global south because that's the only way forward in my view great thank you very much naki this was so interesting uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was very exciting to be able to uh, um, listen to you and, and get your views on these topics we got another question which i will forward to you by by email um, um by jing, jing yu liu and i would also ask those that wanted to ask questions but didn't get the opportunity to write directly to naki so that um, he can he can answer in writing. With yeah. that, let me let me close the seminar. Uh, thank you again very much, Naki, and thank you all for participating uh, in, in this exciting seminar. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.